when you hear the law of reciprocity, it sounds just like a big scientific term or something mm -hmm. like that. But really all that means is when you give something of value, mm -hmm. it's going to come back to you, whether it's from that person or somewhere else. And what's given will move back. <laughs> Welcome to Profession Session. I'm your host, Brody Vinson. And in this show, I interview professionals across all types of different industries, whether it be corporate stars, business owners, entrepreneurs, and talk a little bit about what's allowed them to be so successful in whatever they do. Today, my guest is Matt Craig. And Matt's here to talk a little bit about B2B marketing, being a business owner and entrepreneur and a variety of other things. You're involved in a lot of stuff. Yeah, it's, uh, it's gaining. <laughs> Everything yeah. seems to be... Uh, merging together here and there but yeah there's there's a lot going on right now absolutely well matt thank you so much for being on yeah of course happy to be here happy to have you and i'm excited to get into it yep i'm ready man let's do it so i think the best place to kick it off we were kind of talking a little bit off air but you had uh this this agency that you started back in the day slam agency i think that might be a good kind of entry point to just tell them a little bit about your background how you got into that what led to that and, and kind of what that was so i started out in in design first as, as a graphic designer, you kind of work your way through branding and then you start building brands for relatives. And then, <laughs> yeah. you know, you get into, oh, well, now, you know, my aunt's friend that has a restaurant needs, you know, a logo and a brand. And then, you know, then you get from there into naming and then you move all these different places. And all of a sudden you turn from a graphic designer into an actual like, you know, brand mm -hmm. uh specialist or, or storyteller per se, I guess you could call. It's a very good it. entry point. Yeah, it is. Because if you can, I, I always tell people when they ask how they should get started in marketing, I always say like, learn everything you possibly can about branding and storytelling because yeah. everything, everything comes from that. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and so forget the tactics, like forget like, Oh, what software are you using? Or, you know, what are you doing to move the needle here or there? Just forget all that. Mm -hmm. Just really, really study brand and storytelling. So little tip for anybody wanting to get into marketing. But so I started there as a graphic designer and then, you know, it progresses from there. And all of a sudden, you know, somebody needs a website and you're like, well, I know design. I can, mm -hmm. you know, give it a shot. I'll, so I designed the website and then I would, you know, give it to the developer and they would develop it. And then pretty soon you're like, uh, maybe I should, you know, check into development. I mean, I'm already designing the site, you know, I could probably figure that out. And it kind of intrigued me. So and I got a little bit into dev and worked on some, you know, website building and things like that. So it's kind of a natural progression for marketers and people that are involved in branding to move into those stages. And then I met two of my partners at the time and we kind of hit it off because we had very different skill sets. Mm -hmm. I want to pause real quick. I think that's a really good note because just to, you know, talk about business in general, when you're thinking about starting a business, finding partners that don't necessarily have the same skill set as you, but bring a different kind of unique thing to the table yeah. works out really well because... And, you know, as long as you can work together and mesh well, you don't want to be just replicating yourself because then yeah. you're going to be wanting to do the same things. You want to find someone that excels in the other areas. Yeah, 100 percent, 100 percent. And like, well, I'm sure we'll get into this later in the conversation, but every business I've started, I always bring partners in that have a very unique skill set. You can't do anything by yourself. You can try. Yeah. And there are some people that are successful, but if you really look behind them, they always have a team or partners or somebody that's running things behind the scenes. So we'll get into sure. that later. But I have my two partners, obviously. The reason it worked is because I was brand and storytelling. Uh, I loved branding, design, uh, aesthetics, yeah. you know, the story behind a brand, like uh, helping people understand that story. How are we going to tell that story effectively? All that good stuff. The whole ideation process. Yeah, just in, in general, right? And so I just, I just loved that. And so I had my one of my other partners was very much uh, tactical, mm -hmm. PPC, SEO, dev. Like he was very much into the. Okay, now we have a beautiful brand. How are we going to move the needle for this company, right? How the gonna, operations. Exactly. Yep. You know how are we going to build revenue? What. What's it look like, you know, for our clients, for us? And so he was very tactical. And then we had another guy that was all video. Oh, and so awesome. he was very visual. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so it, it was a it was a really good combination, and it worked uh, really well, and and started fast, and and did really well for a number of years, and then. Long story short, I ended up moving to Florida. We had you had mentioned you were in St. Louis at the time. I was. I was in St. Right? Louis at the mm -hmm. time, and I, and our agency offices were in St. Louis, and at that time. 
you know, remote work really wasn't a thing yet. So we had the big, beautiful agency offices and, Mm -hmm. you know, everybody was there and we had chair races and around the office. And, you know, (laughs) when clients would come in, we'd have chair races and put the scores on the board. Oh, that's awesome. It was a, your typical, you know, creative agency. So we had a bunch of clients in the South, uh, and kind of, we're trying to determine, you know, where do we want to expand? Um, how do we want to expand? And so it kind of made sense. We loved Disney. Uh, Mm -hmm. we had four kids at the time and I'm like, I really love Orlando. It's kind of an up and coming city. Uh, you know, it, at the time now it's like crazy busy, but at the time it wasn't that bad, you Mm -hmm. know, traffic and stuff like that. So we're like, we should, we should check out Orlando. So long story short, we decided to put a slam office in Florida here in Orlando and, my wife has this idea for a, you know, a women's jewelry business. It's called Lillian and Co. And she came to me and was like, Hey, I want to do this, you know, this business. And Mm -hmm. I'm like, no, I don't do inventory businesses. Like I'm a creative guy. Like we don't, I don't want to deal with him. Whole different kind of focus. Whole different ball game. Right. So I said no. And she continued to push it. I'm like, you know what? If if you've got, if you got the idea and you're excited about it, I'll build the brand, I'll build the Mm -hmm. website. You, you know, do your thing. I'll Take help wherever I can, it. right? Yeah. Um, so she does. She, you know, finds a manufacturer and build, and creates the designs. And, you know, it, obviously me, my background being in, in brand design, you know, obviously the brand aesthetic and everything was on point. And mm-hmm. so she launches and within 24 hours had sold 300 plus, like, wow. or had 300 plus orders. Um, wow. So... <laughs> What were the different parts of that launch? Like, what what were the different aspects? Maybe like, yeah, just like a, as a whole picture. <clears throat> so, we actually um, this was before influencer marketing was really a thing, um, and we had this idea um, that we had seen from a friend of ours. Um, and basically, what we did is IG was still fairly new too, mm-hmm. and so we decided to reach out to these Disney influencers. The, 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 the company is very much Disney inspired company. It's all inspirations, but it's all based on Disney quotes and sayings and things. Oh, like interesting. That. So, okay. Um, Perfect thing for Orlando. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So we reached out to, I want to say it was probably a good 15 plus mm-hmm. influencers. We had at the time we had one sample product. We didn't have a product yet. Um, these were all pre-orders. Mm-hmm. So she reached out to these influencers in the area and and basically said, look, here's the picture of the product. This is the the packaging was beautiful. Um, so these were people with kind of substantial followings for the time on correct. Instagram, okay. and and their following was primarily Disney uh, following. So like they posted a lot of pictures in the parks. Now you see this everywhere now, right? This yeah. was not, you know, back in 2000 and what was that? 15, I guess. Yeah. I had a girl on that's like my age. I'm 25 for reference. Um, she's yeah. like my age and she actually has her own jewelry brand and it got huge just through influencer marketing. Yeah. So this sounds like a little good, good deal before that. I think she got started more like 2016, 17 ish. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it works really well for that. Company. Totally. Yeah. And so, like I said, we had one product and so we couldn't send them product, mm-hmm. right? So we had to pick influencers that were within the Orlando area because we only had one product. Yeah. So she's like, look, I'll meet you. Like you put the product on. I'll, t- she's with my wife's a photographer, which also helps. Yeah. Um, you know, I'll do a photo shoot with you. I'll get all the content. I'll send you the pictures. And can you post on this day at this time? Wow. Uh, and just outlining exactly yeah. that. Yeah. And we said, and as soon as we get the product in, we'll send you the product afterwards, right? Now, is that, this is in the early days, was that just agreeing that they would get the product for free just in exchange the product, for doing yeah. it? Yeah. Because at that point, you it was know, so early. influencers didn't really know their worth yet. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of these people didn't have brand deals and there weren't, you know, platforms out there where you could find influencers. And I mean, this is way early in this. Right? Yeah, the Wild West days. Yeah, the at only, that point, if the you're only, making... If you're getting any kind of benefit off your following, it's a new thing. Yeah. Like, Whoa. It was a bonus, what? right? It was beer money, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or wine money. <laughs> yeah. But uh, but yeah, at that point, it was it was kind of a new thing. So, I mean, they were ecstatic. Like, you know, mm-hmm. they had, you know, 10, 15,000 followers, and they were like, oh, sweet, this brand wants to do a photo shoot with me, yeah. right? And that's going to give me content, and I get a free product, so we'll do it. Yeah. So we did that, and they ended up, you know, posting and we asked them all to post at the same day, the same time on the launch. We did a, a, pr- a pre-campaign collecting emails, you know, showing the photo of the 
of the products we had at the time, which was just a quote bracelet. It's kind of, you know, kind of like a, I mean, you see them a lot now, but it's almost like a, like the Cartier cuff. Okay. Yeah. But it yeah. had a, you know, had a quote on it instead. Okay. So we did that. Everybody posted, uh, we did pre-campaign to, to grab email addresses and, you know, show them the different product and the packaging and all that stuff. Uh, so we had roughly 15 or so influencers post. And then off of that, we also had a bunch of other people post because they shared their con, they shared all that content. Yeah. And it kind of pseudo went viral. And mm -hmm. I mean, it was just off to the races from there. So that's awesome. Um, one really focused, concerted effort all at the same time. Yeah. And so that's when we realized, wait, we could, we could do this over and over again for every product launch. Yeah. Right? And just, and so what we did is we created a program called the Dream Ambassador Program is what we called it. And it was basically our brand ambassadors, but you know, got a brand nice, nice little cheesy <laughs> Dream Ambassador. Um, and they were so loyal, man. Like they just, they loved the brand. They loved the message. Um, you know, the brand was very inspirational and, uh, my wife has a, a you know, just a, a gift of just speaking to people where they're at. And mm -hmm. there was a card inside the package that talked about, you know, um, uh, what that bracelet meant and how it was going to affect their life. And it's just, there was just a, there was a lot there and people yeah. just started falling in love with the brand. It's like a whole experience. Yeah. yeah. And so it was very giftable too, because if you had somebody going through something, you could go through the quotes, grab one, give it to them. So it, it was just awesome. a, yeah, it was just a, a really, really cool, you know, brand. Um, and so I think within 18 months, you know, it was, the brand was doing over seven figures and, um, wow. you know, it just kind of blew up. And, and it wasn't what I had intended. Right? Yeah. I mean, I, so I'm sitting over here in, in the agency world thinking, okay, you know, this thing I, is really I love working. what I do here, mm -hmm. um, but this thing's really moving. So yeah. it wasn't the easiest transition. My partner and my two partners and I, obviously, you know, when you're, when you're leaving a relationship you've had for a while, it's not always easy and there's yeah. some bumps in the road and a little bit, some misunderstandings and, you know, I don't want to cherry coat anything uh, yeah. when you're. It's when you're not severing, pretty in business. Right, yeah, it's not. And and so um, when you're severing a relationship you've had for a while, uh, you hope things go well, mm -hmm. and but they don't always go well. So, yeah. But long story short, I was able to, you know, leave that relationship and move on with Lillian and Co. And so I was there for, uh, goodness, well, I'm still there technically. I'm mm -hmm. kind of, you know, still helping out with that. That brand's still going strong. So, but That's awesome. But was able to help out with that. And um, was doing some marketing consulting on the side, mm -hmm. uh, just here and there with you know different brands and things sure. like that. You don't get away from it once you're yeah you know once you're uh, it's a passion yeah once you're involved and, and you're passionate about it like you take every opportunity to you know help where you can or yeah. whatever. And so I had a friend of ours call me and say, hey, this friend of mine that you know is the president of this this large uh, non bank lender. I'm thinking, I didn't even know at the time what a non-bank lender was. Like, what was that, right? Could you describe that a little bit? Yeah, so basically uh, a non-bank lender means that it's a, a company that offers loans and financing products to businesses mm -hmm. or consumers. But Without classifying themselves as with, a bank. But they're not a bank, right? Mm -hmm. Because banks take or take or have depository relationships with clients. Right. And so if you don't have a depository relationship and you're just a lender, you can actually be much, much more... Um, or, flexible uh, yeah much yeah. less discretionary right mm, uh yeah. and much more flexible because you're like we don't need your your account we just yeah. you know want to see if you're worthy of us lending you some money yeah so it lets you be a lot more flexible um and so and they were an sba lender mm -hmm. and so sba is a you know a, a unique program a lot of people don't know much about sba obviously everybody does now because of the paycheck protection program mm -hmm. which is ppp but at the time you know SBA was a very, very kind of an early niche. stages kind yeah. of thing, and it's I mean it's been around forever, but until PPP, nobody really knew unless you were you know deep in business or your bank told mm -hmm. you about it or whatever. So it's much more on the scene now. It's like kind of a premier option for getting started. Yeah. So my friend told me, hey, this you know this guy wants to you know has some questions about marketing and and they're really growing and and they were already he had already started an. Uh, uh, another company that sold to, I believe it was Merrill Lynch. Um, and so he's already had done well and had yeah. moved on to you know, the record. second company and was like, hey, you got to talk to this guy. And so I sat down with him, uh, you know, in his office and uh, we chatted and chatted and chatted. And I think four hours later, <laughs> yeah, you know, after us just chatting marketing and stuff like that, he's like, hey, would you be able to come back tomorrow? Because, you know, I still have more questions. I'm like, yeah, yeah. sure. So came back to uh, the next day. 
chatted some more and that turned into a lengthy conversation. We just, we just kind of hit it off. Yeah. Um, he had a very unique, um, viewpoint on business and the way things should be done. And, you know, he was not traditional at all. Um, when you, when you think of traditional marketing and things like that, you know, a lot of these banks have what, what's called a BDO or business development officer. Mm-hmm. And those business development officers are paid six figures, you know, to bring in, you know, leads. Yeah. <laughs> right. To the yeah. bank. Just the kind of classic lead yeah. generation. Yeah. And you're, you're going out finding leads and not only are they paid six figures, but they're also, also paid commission, mm-hmm. you know, on top of that. So his model was complete, just completely turned that upside down. He wanted to build a marketing machine that went direct to the business owner and bypass the BDO, bypass potential brokers, and actually, you know, went direct to the business owners where they could apply directly with the lender and cut out that middleman so the experience was better. Meanwhile, you're over here making some grand slams in content marketing. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm like, so I, of course, we start talking and I'm, I'm spitting all, like, you know, we talked before we started recording and I'm, I'm, I give away the farm, right? I, mm-hmm. I give as much value as I possibly can to everybody. So those conversations were me basically spitting out all these ideas of like, well, Here's what you need to do. You know, you need to bypass yep. this. You need to go the PPC route. You need to start social ads. You need to start content marketing. Like, you've got to get out there so that these business owners see you as a valuable resource and blah, blah, blah. I'd like to focus on that a little bit more, too. Yeah. We were, this is another thing we were kind of talking about off air is just this law of reciprocity. And you are you buy, you buy into that very strongly, and we were I do as well. We were kind of talking about that as just this concept of, you know, giving away things and knowledge for free really does bring itself back in different ways. Yeah. So when you, (laughs) it's a, it's a loaded, it's a loaded subject, but I I do love talking about it. So when you hear the law of reciprocity, it sounds just like a big, like, you know, scientific term or something Mm -hmm. like that. But really all that means is when you give something like a value, Mm -hmm. it's going to come back to you, whether it's from that person or somewhere else. Yeah. You know, the law, law if you, you know, physics and, and metaphysics, the law of reciprocity basically means, you know, what's given will will move back. Mm-hmm. And, and, and a, you know, my short, uh, <laughs> yeah, my short description of it. And it's it's kind of hard to see that sometimes. Right. Because it's it's not necessarily this direct one for one thing. It's not like you give away a free ebook and immediately get a client in return. It's exactly. like you, Give, 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 and then all of a sudden maybe one client comes. And yep. Down the road, you kind of build on that, build on that, and you just keep growing that way, and eventually you've got this machine. Exactly, yeah, and it and it doesn't matter where it comes from either, right? Like, mm-hmm. And I think when you give expecting to get something in return, like you've, you've, you've missed the point, right? Exactly. And, and people can smell that a mile away. It's like you give because you're passionate about it and you want to educate people and you want to put it out there. You want to make the industry that you're operating in a better place. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and so what happens is over time as you're giving, you know, whether it's from that person or another person or somebody that heard it from them or whatever, that will come back to you Mm -hmm. and, and it may not come back like, in the form of a client either it may come in your personal life somewhere Mm -hmm. it may come somewhere else so it's just a but you really have to buy into that philosophy yeah because if you don't buy into it and you just keep giving and you're looking for where it's going to come from then you know you You miss the the point point. yeah so like stuff will happen and i always think like anytime something happens to me i'm like hmm, interesting i wonder where yeah that began right i wonder like what did i get when was that seed planted exactly for that could have been 10 years ago exactly yeah so for that really cool thing to just happen to me you know where in the universe did i plant that seed for that to come back so it's just a really cool thought process when you buy into it it really is uh you know everything you do uh you do without expectation because, makes life fun dude. oh man it's, it's just it's a fun, fun perspective to have yep. to get through life with so and i know i get you know i frustrate people uh on my team because you yeah. know they're like oh we probably shouldn't be giving that away or you know, like, oh my gosh, you had, a, you know, that was a two hour call. It's supposed to be an hour call. You're going to be late for your next call. It's like, but if there's an exchange of, of like, there's a certain energy exchange, you know, when you're talking to a person and yeah. I always say like energy trumps like schedule, right? Yeah. So if, if I'm in a, in a, in the mode of exchanging energy and there's value being given and that person is like, you know, in the mode of receiving and I'm like, I could give them more value. Like there's, I don't want to, you know, there's so much more in this conversation we could have. Mm -hmm. Like I don't mind, you know, being a couple minutes late for the next meeting or, you know, something like that. Because like when you're exchanging energy, 
it's so much better to do it right then mm -hmm. than it is to try to move it because you can't pick back up that energy. Yeah. Right? You've yeah. got momentum. Yeah. And it's like, so, and that's not to say I disrespect, you know, the people's, you know, next to them that are in that meeting. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's more so of a, you know, you want to be able to bring value to those people where you're at, where they're at, because like that may be the only opportunity you have. So, um, it's, it's a unique perspective and, you know, some people get it, some people don't, and that's fine. Um, well, yeah. I'd certainly buy into it. I love talking about this. I mean, it's, I've seen it happen for me time and time again, in Yeah, different ways, different forms. Yeah. And we, you know, we were also talking about the, you know, competitive plane versus the, you know, mm -hmm. the creative plane and it, it all, it all lines up with that. You yeah. Know? So if, if you're on the creative plane, this won't be an issue for you. Mm -hmm. Like giving value will never be an issue for me. If you're on the competitive plane, that's, you're going to have an issue with it, right? Because you're going to think, oh, they're going to steal these ideas. Are they going to do this or that or whatever? And that's, that's in the competitive plane. And when you stay in that plane, what happens? Like, you Anything never you gain from you that. never put out your best unique stuff you're always kind of in this defensive mode versus being on the attack trying to get better do better grow yeah and there's a there's a really cool book and it's an old book okay it was written in 1911 by wallace waddles it's called science of getting rich um and if, if you haven't read it you got to read it it's not a long book it's only like 90 pages long some of the best ones are like that yeah. that's it's probably one of those that you can kind of refer back to totally. all the time. It's yeah. got these like tried and true things. Yeah, I'm not even kidding. My wife and I have probably read this book at least 20 times a piece. Wow. Like at least. Um, and we do. We keep out. going back to it. Um, because what you realize is this book, like when you when you read the Bob Proctors and the Tony Robbins and, you know, um, Jay Shetty's and all these different guys that are out now, all the stuff they're talking about, like – it's from that came those from kind of tried and true yeah principles. those old principles and Wallace Waddles is a lot of that, and so a lot of what you know uh, Napoleon Hill who wrote you know so many good books yeah, um, you know Think and Grow Rich and all these different books that everybody sees now like Napoleon Hill that Wallace Waddles was his Tony Robbins right? wow and so like you go down the line and you're like okay well everybody then looked at Napoleon Hill and everybody looks at Bob Proctor and then Tony Robbins and, and so. It's just down the line, but they're mm -hmm. getting the principles from somewhere. Yeah. And so it's cool to go back to the original book. And, and I'm sure Wallace Waddles got it from somewhere, right? Absolutely. Um, so, but, but it's cool to go back to that to original one. source and yeah. seeing like the, the most kind of unfiltered, yeah, just raw. direct version, raw yeah. version of the idea. So, but in that book, he talks specifically about the, you know, competitive plane and the creative plane. And he specifically says, riches and wealth gained on the competitive plane are here today and gone tomorrow. Mm. And the reason for that is because you can't control something you don't create. Right? Yeah. So what happens is when you go and copy and steal and, um, you know, pull from other people, you know, and, and step on other people to get what you want and, you know, run the rat race, mm -hmm. we'll call it. Um, well, I don't, you know, I think it was Lily Tomlin that said, well, if you're in the, win the rat race, you're still a rat, right? Yeah. <laughs> so like, you don't want to be in that plane. If you move over to the competitive or the, excuse me, the creative plane and you're creating the reverse of that, uh, is when you create something that's uniquely you, it can't be taken away. Yeah. Right. It can be copied. It can, it can try, they can try to duplicate it or whatever, but the thumbprint that you left on that is always going to be there. Mm -hmm. And so it can never be really duplicated because you're the one that created it. And, so and how great does it feel if you see, you know, something that you created, maybe some kind of format for something, if you were the original one to do influencer marketing or the very early on, like you were, all of a sudden you see that concept blowing up and being used all over the place. It's got to feel great to just know that you were onto something from the beginning. Yeah, like your for, unique for idea. sure. And, and I mean, the, the cool thing is like, I mean, we created something really cool, right? But we mm. weren't the first ones to do it either. Yeah. So, you know, it was done before us and it's been done in marketing for, you know, centuries, mm -hmm. uh, influencer marketing has. But in that moment in time, we were creating something that we thought would work. And we're like, what if we did it this way? Right? Yeah. And we start thinking through and you know, we could do this and everybody could post at the same time. And what if we did this? And, you know, if we set the price here just for introductory, you know, only for influencers and like all these different things we mm -hmm. had going on at that time. Putting your own unique spin on. That's the creation the process, right? And so like if, if you're creating from there and you're thinking through all this and, and you're not going to be like, okay, well, this is the way these guys did it. 
and so we got to do it this way, right? We're going to do this, and and um, it's got to be this price and this structure and blah blah blah. Then you're working off the competitive plane again, and and what happens is once again, here today, gone tomorrow, right? Exactly. There's and no so, longevity to that. Yeah, and that's why you'll never catch a creator. Like you'll never catch them. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah. So back I, to back to the non-bank lender. Yeah. So um, you had kind of had this couple days in a row of conversation, just really hit it off. Really liked his unique kind of approach, untraditional approach to yeah. everything. And it just it makes me think back to you know your whole background. You had tried something a little untraditional in a couple of your businesses and really seen it work. So that probably attracted you and yeah, showed did. you this could work. It did, and I think. You know, at the time, it was interesting because I'm just, I've am just i just never been a fan of corporate. Like, nothing wrong with, you know, climbing up the corporate ladder. And, yeah. and there's people that, you know, um, are good at that and they enjoy being there. And that's awesome. Like, that's their lane, mm-hmm. right? Go for it. Not my lane. It's a very <laughs> structured, traditional kind of path. And if that's what's comfortable for you, it, it makes sense. I, I'm the same way, though. I Yeah. I don't necessarily thrive in the in the very structured kind of routine path i like to i like to always be doing new stuff creating moving forward so yeah. it's, i've never been a big fan of it either yeah and so you know at the end of that second day when we finished the conversation there and you know obviously he was excited because he was like i think we can really do this mm-hmm. like I, this was kind of a harebrained idea like i don't know if this would work but yeah and so at the end of that conversation he's like hey what do you think about you know coming on and, and being my CMO. Um, and, you know, I, I immediately didn't want to say just no straight mm-hmm. out, but in my head I'm thinking, no way. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I There's not something you were interested it's not, in. I'm just time. not interested in doing corporate and especially not mm-hmm. finance, right? Yeah. Um, so I told him, I said, I don't know, maybe, you know, well, let me think about it. And he's like, he's like, no, I, I, this is for real. Like I, I'm, you know, I want to offer you a position. Mm-hmm. Um, and I said, okay, well, you know, put the, put the offer together. We'll think about it or whatever. But I left thinking like, this is, I'm not going to do this. Yeah. So I get home and tell my wife, you know, okay, second day of conversation. And they just offered me the, you know, chief marketing officer position. And she's like, what? Like, <laughs> yeah, you know, like, and I'm like, I mean, you know, I don't, I don't know what to do. And she's like, Oh, you got to take it. And I'm like, what? No, I don't want to take it. Um, and she's like, babe, you've had your whole life, you know, all you've wanted to do is take companies from like here to here. Mm. And he's like, and she's like, this is your opportunity to do it for a single company, Yeah, you know, as opposed to bouncing around. So we kind of talked it through and, you know, I've got four kids and I've been an entrepreneur, you know, since basically out of high school, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't even finish college because I went straight into, you know, doing my business thing. Yeah. Um, And so, and that's not something I'm ashamed of at all. Like I, I was an athlete in, in, you know, in high school and, and had dreams of being a division one, you know, uh, football, baseball player. Uh, and so I did it for that, mm-hmm. you know, just so I could go there. I mean, uh, you know, a year into that, I was like, I'm done. <laughs> and you got involved in other stuff. Yeah. And I'm just, just like, I wanted on. to do, and, and I just, I'm a hands-on learner. I like to do things and that's how I learn. And I didn't fit into, you know, the normal structure of the way school is, is, the learning structure of the way school was organized. It yeah. just didn't work for me. I um, think it was a, an honest decision that you made and it's clearly worked out for you. Yeah. So without getting into that, I'll be a different podcast. <laughs> um, you know, I came back and, and was like, look, I, I'm not a, a corporate guy. Right. Mm-hmm. And you know, basically, you know what you're getting yourself into here, yeah. right? Like you're going to have to answer to the board. I don't have a college degree. Mm-hmm. Like, and you know, this was a, a massive financial company. I mean, a huge backing. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, to, for him to have to convince his board that, Hey, I'm hiring a CMO and by the way, he doesn't have a college degree. And by the way, he doesn't have a finance background. And by the way, he's never been, you know, anywhere in corporate America before. And it's a little bit of a harebrained idea to begin yeah. with. Yeah. And it was already kind of edgy to begin with. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to let him know, look, you're, you're taking a huge risk here. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I said, I'm willing to do it, mm-hmm. but you've got me for two, three years tops. Gotcha. Right. And I said, at the end of that two or three years, I promise you, I will leave this in better shape than I, it was when I came in and everything that we've talked about will be in place. Whether, and it'll be set up to keep running. Right. And you know, what you want to do after that is fine. 
and I'll even help you find someone to replace me if if you need me to. But I'm not going to be here long term. Yeah. Um, and he, you know, his response to that was, "We'll see." You know, that <laughs> whole thing, like, yeah. Um, Sounds like a pretty good salesman. <laughs> yeah, but uh, but long story short, you know, roughly two years later, uh, I built an internal team, and you know, uh, we got things moving, and and the the hair brain idea actually worked, and mm. you know, we were able to really build a, a marketing machine and sales engine that you know drove actual you know borrowers directly to the lender, um, yeah. which was unheard of in that time. Uh, and so kind of, uh, sounds like more of an inbound focus than an outbound focus. Very much. Yeah. yeah. Uh, very much. I mean, we did, we did do outbound, uh, mm-hmm. but the outbound was directly to, you know, business owners and it was part of our inbound efforts. And, right. You know, we can talk a little bit about that later too, where I believe those, those both go hand in hand. You know, you have inbound agencies and outbound agencies mm-hmm. and it's kind of like sales and marketing departments. Like yeah. they don't talk about, they don't talk to each other. They're always mad at each other. Mm-hmm. You know, marketing's mad that sales isn't closing deals and sales is mad because they're not marketing's not bringing enough leads. You know, yeah. I feel like that's how inbound outbound looks at each other. Um, is like, oh, outbound's just the people that don't, you know, think about story and they don't think about their messaging. Mm-hmm. They just like, you know, go knock doors and blah, blah, blah. And they're so it's just, just playing the numbers game. Yeah. yeah. And so I don't believe that at all. I think they have to go hand in hand and they have to, they have to work f- to our, our, our for and with each other. Yeah. Um, and when you do that effectively, it can be really powerful. Yeah. Because outbound needs inbound content. It does. Right. And so an inbound needs outbound sales. And so you have to understand they work together. And if you don't, it's, you're just going to fail. You can't so, close without the right story and you can't, you know, get the right story out there without the reach out. Exactly. Yeah. So anyway, we did the, you know, the whole, uh, the harebrained idea of, of, you know, going direct to uh, borrowers and it worked. Um, and so I, I kind of, you know, was getting the the itch to start uh, another agency. I, I love agency life. I love, you know, the challenge of, you know, looking at a, a business's, you know, uh, marketing and advertising and seeing, you know, where the gaps are and where mm-hmm. the where the holes are in the story and where the opportunities are and um, and really seeing where can we drive revenue like. Yeah. And so I missed that a little bit, obviously. And, and so I, uh, you know, had already decided, I think I'm going to go for, I think I'm going to go for starting another agency. Um, and so I went to, uh, you know, the president at the time, his name was Chris and, and basically said, Hey, I want to start an agency. Mm-hmm. And so I told you, you had me, you know, two to three years and that time has come yeah. and, and, you know, I want to start an agency and, you know, I don't know what that looks like yet, but I'm just letting you know now, you know, we were, we were, I mean, he's, Getting ahead of yeah, it. he's, he's a good friend now and, um, very easy to talk to and, and just trying to be open and transparent with him. And, and he actually came back and said, well, if this is something you're going to do, then we should probably be your first client. So <laughs> very cool. There you go. So, uh, and that's how, that's how we started the, the new agency, uh, plenty agency. So, uh, they were our first client and they're still a client of ours. Um, and so we have just kind of grown from there and, really focused on b2b growth Mm -hmm. um as as a whole uh when you when you think about b2b marketing it's it's so it's so disjointed you know most b2b marketing is just completely just disjointed what are some of the biggest issues you think b2b marketers face right now i think that the one of the biggest issues b2b marketers faced is is trying to tell your story effectively across Mm -hmm. multiple channels um and Without the, diluting it somewhere along the way. Yeah. And the reason that's a, I shouldn't say it's a challenge. Um, it's a challenge for most companies because they've disjointed their efforts, right? So telling a story across multiple channels is not the challenge. Mm-hmm. If you're working with an internal marketing department and an agency that runs social and an agency that runs ads and an agency that runs LinkedIn outreach and an agency that does email marketing. Yeah. Yeah you cannot effectively tell that story, right? And so... It's going to get diluted from yeah, one agency get diluted. to the next person to the next person. And so what happens is you have, you know, somebody internally typically, you know, a, a marketing director or a content director or something like that that's that's kind of, you know, managing that brand story and managing the brand as a whole. Well, it's up to them to try to tell, you know, to get that social you know, ad agency to understand what that is and blah, 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 all the, mm-hmm. down, all the way down the road. If you have a 
single agency that understands who you are, what you do, you know, the value you bring, the story you're telling consumers, and is focused on growth, Mm -hmm. right, and not just social ads, then when opportunities come, like, that's, that's the opportunity to partner together and tell that story effectively wherever that makes sense. And I think that's what's missing in B2B right now. And the reason it's missing is because they can't afford expensive agencies. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, but when you look at segmenting out, when you segment out all these different agencies, I mean, I'm not even kidding. Like, um, we had a client, uh, and technically they're still with us, but at one point, you know, they were using five different agencies um, plus freelancers. Wow. And so I'm thinking, how in the world do you? Do you how do you even keep that? track like, of it? Like, yeah, yeah. You, don't, you don't know what the you know the right hand doesn't know what the left hand's doing. You're running around just trying to keep track of everything the whole time. Yeah. There's no way you can focus on delivering the message you, the right way. You can't be effective. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, you're executing everything. Yeah. But it's not cohesive. Exactly. And so, and and when you looked at it, you could tell like the mm-hmm. social ads looked completely different than the email marketing. The email marketing looked completely different than outbound efforts. Like, it was just it's so disjointed. If you're trying to think about, you know, keeping someone moving down the funnel and they see you one place and see you another place and it looks completely different, they're yeah. not, they might not even recognize that they're seeing the same thing. Yeah. And it, and it's not, uh, the messaging might be similar, but if it's not following a cohesive flow, mm-hmm. it just disconnects. Yeah. So, so what, what we've tried, what we've tried to do is really help businesses understand that, and we call it the conversion codex, right? And that's that's just our methodology. It's a yeah. fancy name for what we do. But sounds cool as hell. <laughs> yeah. But what we try to do is basically help businesses understand that there is a method behind helping, you know, other businesses, if you're B2B, obviously business owners, you know, whoever your ICP or your ideal client profile is. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's an executive, maybe that's a director of marketing in this company, whatever. We try to help these businesses that are marketing understand that there is a point A and point B, right? And so to get from point A to point B, there are certain things that have to be done. And to get from point B to point C, there are certain things that have to be done. So you take that route. And when you can take that route and you know your path, it's so much easier. Mm-hmm. And so... You can just outline it out, schedule it out, figure out exactly what you need to do along the way. Yeah, here's what needs to be done. Here's the budget. And, mm-hmm. you know, and so even if... And, and we've, we haven't had this happen yet, but like, even if they decide, well, we still want, you know, to use this agency for social. Well, great. That's not a problem. But the, this agency is going to follow this roadmap, mm-hmm. right? And they're yeah. going to do it this way. Yeah. And so it's totally fine if they execute it, but they can't be coming up with their own strategy. Mm-hmm. Right. So it's like, it has to follow this methodology yeah. because it's, it's proven it works. And so if you follow that methodology, like growth will happen yeah and so when it's you step about out, actually making sure that methodology gets followed correct yeah and so when you step outside of that we don't guarantee results mm-hmm. so if you can stay within the conversion codex that we've built and within the methodology then we'll guarantee the results because that's where we hang our hats right mm-hmm. and so there's very few agencies you'll find that will that will say oh we guarantee our work or we guarantee we're going to bring this much revenue we guarantee we're going to bring this many appointments or whatever right um and we're willing to do that as long as they stay within mm-hmm. the conversion codex. That's very so, cool. And so you just, you excel at being able to kind of bring these agencies together. So do you have a couple internal agencies, not full agencies necessarily, but do you have kind of internal departments within the agency that focus on particular things? We do, yeah. Um, and the the main thing that we start with is story, right? Mm-hmm. Like what what story are you telling? What does your brand feel like in the marketplace? Like, yeah. you know, um, and whether that's intentional or unintentional, right? <laughs> and really dive into that and try to f- try to figure that out. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's probably the hardest thing for most businesses. That's that's the hardest thing. That's the hardest hurdle to get over, right? Because they want to get right into point B. Mm-hmm. Like, what ads are we running? Like, what leads are we driving? And mm-hmm. it's like, pause. <laughs> yeah. Pause, right? Uh, we will get there. Exactly. But You have to without know this, what they're going to look like first. Yeah. And, uh, and it's such a buzzword, like, oh, you got to tell the story, you know, you got to find the story. And it's like, I get that it is, but it, there's a reason why it's a buzzword. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And so we spend, we, we do spend, you know, more time than most agencies in that, in that, 
you know, first Story stages telling, of, ideation yeah, phase. you know, how are we messaging things? And like, you've got to think about how you're messaging things on every aspect of the platform. Inbound's going to have, you know, from the story that we've created and from the ICPs that we've created, because the story's built around your personas for your ideal client profile. Because mm-hmm. um, if you're telling a story and no one's resonating, it doesn't matter, right? Yeah. So what you really have to do is you have to figure out who your ICP is, look at the story and determine does the storyline need to change, mm-hmm. right? Because if we're going after Brody Vincent, you know, at, you know, Chef Fly, mm-hmm. and he's our ICP, and we're telling a story about, you know, how we uh, drive inbound leads on LinkedIn for, you know, the restaurant industry. Mm-hmm. Like, you may or may not res- resonate with that, right? Yeah. Um, and so, like, we got we to gotta rethink this. You got to make sure the messaging... messaging is meant for the ideal client first. Correct. And so we come up with the story, the ICP, we make sure those match. Once those match, now we take that story and and basically every every aspect or every segment is messaged differently, but it's all based on the story in the ICP. So you might have inbound efforts. So all the content we create, we're going to say, okay, who's our ICP for every piece of content? What story are we telling? How, how do we how create we content you? that resonates with Correct. Um, and so everything is is moving around that. Um, and it doesn't matter what segment you're in, you know, whether, like I said, whether it's inbound, outbound, social ads, you know, SEO, it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Um, conference, you know, you could be at a conference. You, you got to step back and say, you know, is, do we need to change the storyline yeah. on this for the messaging for this conference? And the story doesn't That's change, awesome. right? It's just how you tell the story that changes. Yeah. And the messaging changes a little bit. So, but that's the first key. Most businesses aren't willing to take the time they need to do that because they want to get directly into, you know, <laughs> our, our bread and butter is like um, automated outbound. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's kind of where most of our bread and butter is. Yeah. And, and that's our, I would say that's probably our secret sauce. But, you said, to get so you there, said secret sauce without getting too much into it. Can you talk about platforms at all, or is that a little yeah. bit? What are some platforms that you like to use? So, <clears throat> for specifically for the LinkedIn outreach, mm-hmm. um, we've got kind of a I call it proprietary, but anybody can use the platforms. It's yeah. just the way that we connect them that's gotcha. proprietary. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, we use Limlist. Uh, we use Wallaxy. We use Apollo.io uh, okay. for data enrichment. Uh, we use Drop Contact for data enrichment, um, and so basically, what we do is we take the ICP, we drop it into you know a software like Apollo or Drop Contact or something like that, and so that we can enrich that data. Hmm. Uh, we'll go to Sales Navigator and find as many ICPs as we can in and around that. We'll mm-hmm. export that, drop that into Apollo, and Drop Contact uh, to see okay, what does our market look like, right? Yeah. Because if we've built a wow. If we built an ICP for a market mm-hmm. and that market is less than 5,000 people, then you have to have a different company. We got to rebuild our ICP, right? Yeah. Because it's not a big enough market. Mm-hmm. We're going to be through that in three weeks. Yeah. So, and the story might resonate effectively, but unless you've got, you know, unless you're selling a product that's really, really high ticket, mm-hmm. you know, you're going to have to, you're going to have to find a different IP, ICP. So, exactly. So we always check that. Um, and we say to start a, uh, to move through the conversion codex after we get through that first phase, we need 10,000 plus in the market. Mm-hmm. And so once we've realized, okay, this, you know, we've got 10,000 plus that are our market, that's our ICP. We take that, we go to sales, like I said, go to sales navigator. Um, we take and export that data from sales navigator. Once we've built that profile in there, excuse me. Um, and then we will take it to a data enrichment and, and any data enrichment works. We just, we like Apollo. How would you describe data enrichment? I haven't used or heard that used in this context before. Yeah. So data enrichment basically means, so sales navigator, which is an amazing tool. Like, yeah, I've it, heard incredible. Yeah, I need to get into it cause I've never used it, but I've heard incredible things. People, they just don't use it effectively. It is such a powerful tool. I mean, for B2B, it's the Holy grail, yeah. right? I mean, there is not there is not another platform out there like LinkedIn that has like all of this accurate data on businesses, mm-hmm. right? Because LinkedIn, what do you have to do? You have to like when you start an account, you have to upload your driver's license and a piece of ID and blah blah blah. It's like all these things to verify who you are because they want to mm-hmm. make sure that you know these interactions are authentic. 
Yeah. And, and everyone so, that's working for the company is going to be linked to it right. in a very clear way. Yeah. And so it's uh, great for ABM, account-based marketing, because you can see all you know the structure and all kinds mm. of stuff. So yeah, Sales Navigator is amazing. LinkedIn is amazing. So once you've figured out how to run your searches on LinkedIn, mm-hmm. um, which is an art in and of itself, because your, your sales navigator searches, you know, are, are Boolean. So like you can actually like, you know, put parentheses around stuff and put negative keywords in and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. So once you've learned how to do that, you can build like this per the ICP that you built in your personas during the first phase, you can actually build that out in sales navigator and it'll tell you, okay, we've got you know, based on your ICP and the region you wanted, we've got 15,000. This market, yeah. yeah. Wow. And so we can export that from Sales Navigator. Once we export that from Sales Navigator, LinkedIn's going to give us, you know, company name, uh, LinkedIn URL. You know, sometimes it'll give you an email. Um, a lot of times it's a personal email, mm-hmm. which, which we don't like to deal with, right? Right. Because that it just seems like, oh, well, you know, they got, it's clearly, it's if just you, unprofessional to send to a personal email when, when they've got a professional. And you kind of get tuned out that way. Yeah. I know I'm guilty of it if I see stuff come up on my personal email that's like being, it's like some kind of outreach to me I'm not really paying attention to. Yeah. But if it's coming to my work email, then I'm like, okay, this could have something to do with a problem that I yeah. have in my business. Though. And you're probably at least going to check it out and say, okay, maybe this has some value. Let me read it, right? Exactly. Um. So it'll give you some data. Mm -hmm. Um, And so we take the data that it gives us, and then we move to one of our data enrichment, um, you know, like Apollo.io, like I said, is a a great one. Um, And so they've got 250 million, you know, data sets Mm -hmm. or individuals, we'll call them at this point, um, that you can basically, you're taking that data, uploading it or importing it into... Apollo, mm-hmm. and you're saying, can you find all of these custom fields that we need, wow. right? That to make sure that this is our our ideal client profile. Wow. And so we upload it. We say, okay, we need you to enrich these fields. Mm-hmm. In other words, make sure the data is right. Yeah. And then any data that we need, we want you to also add that. So, for instance, you know, if one of your companies is a, you know, let's say your marketing company, right? Mm-hmm. And you deal strictly with HubSpot. Mm-hmm. So if that if you were coming to us, we'd say, okay, if you want you know to find people that are currently using HubSpot that are looking for a new agency, we'll put that in a, in Apollo and say we want these technologies. Wow! And so we can say search the company website for HubSpot script. Yeah. And so we can go find the HubSpot HubSpot script oh. on their website to see if they're utilizing the tracking script. That's incredible. So if you're using the tracking script on HubSpot, we know you're a HubSpot user. Yeah. So now we can say, okay, well, are you running social ads? Mm -hmm. So we'll also check to see if you have the Facebook script or the Twitter script or LinkedIn or whatever for the ads tracking. Wow. We can check and see if you're running PPC and how much you're spending. So like all these little things we can run to enrich that to make sure that – so like for instance, if you said, hey, look, we're looking for – in our ICP, one of the things that we're looking for is they have to be a HubSpot user and they have to have X amount of revenue mm-hmm. and they have to have X amount of employees. And you probably help them kind of come up with that list of things that they do need to be looking for. Correct. They might yeah. not have even figured that out for themselves yet. Yeah. And when we're building that ICP, yeah, and you're coming up with that, like you said, the questions we're asking are let's take a look at your current clients, mm-hmm. right, and figure out your best clients and your worst clients. And so we look at those sets and we say, what are the attributes of your worst clients that you don't want? Mm -hmm. Okay. And what are the best attributes of your best clients that you, you want in everybody? And let's double down on this. Yeah. You double down on this. And then you, you use these negative keywords Mm -hmm. in here in sales navigator and Apollo to make sure that we're not hitting those people. Wow. So, so it's, that's why we spend so much time on this pro on the front end of the Mm -hmm. story and ICP, because once you have that nailed down, like you, you, You everybody you you talk to is Mm -hmm. going to feel like you're talking directly to them. Wow. So you're no, you're no longer, you know, randomly reaching out with a, you know, social ad to somebody you think might be your target. You're reaching out with a perfect version of your story that's meant to reach them in the exact right way you know they're the exact icp right wow so after you've got that and you've kind of and we're we're talking about software so apollo enriches that that's basically Mm -hmm. enrichment software the other thing apollo does is it takes any personal emails and runs it against their database and finds the business email Mm 
Wow. So it can tell us, hey, look, we've replaced this personal email. Here's your actual business email. And it does it. It's got an algorithm that does it. Mm -hmm. So even if they don't have the actual email, they can tell by looking at structured emails to and from and across channels to yeah, see what the structure is. Yeah, very structured. From what that is. And it's very, very accurate. They're yeah. very good at what they do. And there's a lot of data enrichment companies out there. They're not the only one. You know, mm -hmm. you've got Clearbit and all these other guys that do this really well. Um, we've just found Apollo's, you know, it's easy, been easy to you. work with. And yeah. yeah. Uh, Sometimes and, and, that's <laughs> one of the biggest selling points for software is, is it easy to work with because you're going to want to keep working with yeah. it. Yeah, and it's affordable and it's easy to import, export. It's just, it's a good, good choice. So um, so once you've got the ICP, um, the you know, I was talking to you about the secret sauce of, of kind of the outbound. Um, I think our secret, star, our secret sauce, and we give this away, starts with the warm-up of the audience. Mm -hmm. So most people will take that ICP and say, okay, sweet. We got the emails and we got the LinkedIn address. Let's start an outbound email campaign. Let's start an outbound LinkedIn campaign, mm -hmm. right? We don't do that. We move directly to a warm-up phase where we take all of our data, the emails that we receive, personal and business, and we upload that to Facebook and LinkedIn and Google, and we say, okay, Facebook, we want to build a custom audience around the these people, audience. right? Just a custom first. Okay. Okay, we'll get to look alike. Yeah. But we build a custom first audience, which we say, okay, we need you to find all these people for us. Mm-hmm. And we want like to start this set of attributes essentially. No, it's it's them directly. Oh, them. We have their emails. Oh, right, right. Right. Yeah. So and that's why we keep the personal emails. Because typically they will use their personal email yeah. in, in um social. Yeah, especially if they used it for LinkedIn in the first place, they probably used it for both. I know Correct. that's the case for me. Yeah. So we say, Okay, we want you to find these guys mm -hmm. and we want to start advertising specifically to this set of people. Wow. And so what we do is we're running ads specifically to that ICP around their pain points, around who we are as a business or who you are as a business, you know, if we're working for, with a client um, that are, you know, driving valuable content, um, introducing the brand, anything we can get in front of five to seven is our frequency rate, right? Mm -hmm. So ad frequency just means the number of times you see an ad in a day. That's gotcha. all that means. Okay. And so the ad frequency is, is five to seven. Is what we shoot for. Per person, essentially. Correct. Okay. In in the first two weeks. And so gotcha. we don't send a we don't send a message out in the first two weeks. We're going we're hitting a, hitting them five to seven times a day with our brand, valuable content, whatever we can, to warm them up so that when we send that first message, which is typically on LinkedIn and not email, I'll get to that here in a minute. When we, when we send that first message, subconsciously, they're like, Wait a minute, I think I've seen these guys. Yeah. Right? Because they're they seeing it like, five oh, to seven times a day. I mean, and they probably feel like, oh, they're everywhere. They they they're know exactly everywhere. what they're doing. They're like, they're obviously serving a huge audience. They're yeah. out here. I've seen them so many times. Exactly. And so, and when they're seeing it on multiple platforms, because you can do the same thing with with LinkedIn, mm -hmm. right? We try to stay away from Twitter um, because Twitter's well, LinkedIn and Twitter are both expensive, but LinkedIn you have to be there because that's where all the B two B companies yeah. are. Yeah. Um, but we will build that custom audience in Google too for retargeting purposes. So right. we can say, Hey, we want you to target these guys and use display targeting on all these different sites, right? Mm -hmm. Retargeting, but, yeah. display ads. We'll, we'll retarget them with, dis with display ads. So once they've seen that five to seven days and we've got them essentially warmed up, right? Now they're ripe for mm -hmm. us to hit with messaging. Yeah. And so we start with LinkedIn. And the first, the first message we send on LinkedIn is pretty much the same for every industry, every company we work with. It really? doesn't change. It's worked, and we stick with it. And it's all that, proven. literally all we say is, hey, first name, because we use automated software. Mm -hmm. We're not sending these manually, obviously, yeah. to you know 10,000 people. Mm -hmm. um, hey, first name, um, noticed you were in the industry, whatever mm -hmm. it is restaurant space, tech space, marketing space, whatever. Mm -hmm. Notice you were in whatever space, um, you know, would love to connect, you know, or we should connect or would love to connect something along those lines. Um, and if we typically try to start regionally first, so if you're based here in Florida, we will work our way out. So the first three series of messages we send are to, if you were in Florida, we'd send to Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, anything, you know, like close in proximity. Mm -hmm. The first message would also say in between, it would say, hey, first name, notice you're in the tech space and we're relatively close, parentheses, Florida, mm -hmm. right? So 
And then they would say, thought we should connect. Yeah. That's the message that goes out with the invite, mm -hmm. right? It does, it's really effective. It yeah. does a couple things really effectively. One, you got their first name, which pretty much any automation can do now. So mm -hmm. they know that. So that's yeah. not impressive. Mm -hmm. Noticed you were in the whatever space, okay? Which is a little very, more impressive. Very few softwares can do that. There's only mm -hmm. a handful. Really? Okay. Yeah, because they're, they can't be they can't be accurate, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and it's so, taken a lot of work to get it to that point. And people and change jobs so much. Yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah. you know, they change position. All of a sudden, yeah, notice you're in marketing, and they're not. They're in finance now. Yeah. So, so we have and, to be really careful with that. If that happens, you lost them already. Yeah, and we found a trick there, too, which, again, probably for another podcast. But So you've got their, their name, their industry. And you also have told them we're relatively close. We're in Florida too. Yeah. So that to, is to us has been the most effective thus far. We get a sixty-eight percent acceptance rate on that. Wow. So, um, and I think it's typically because when you think about your LinkedIn, you know, invitations that are coming in, mm -hmm. um, a lot of them ninety-nine percent of to them a sales pitch. They're selling in the invite, yeah. right? Exactly. And so if you can be that detailed with your invite and say, first name, industry, we're close, thought we should connect, it's mm -hmm. like, okay, maybe this might be a real human, right? Yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> exactly. you don't see this anymore. Yeah. So it's been really effective. Like I said, we got a 68% average acceptance rate, which is yeah. really high. Um, some industries, we've seen it higher than that. Wow. Some industries, it's a little lower, but... Mm -hmm. But that's been really effective. And then the sequence to follow up with that is all value. We do not sell on LinkedIn. So we don't, well, I shouldn't Smart. say that. We don't sell until way further down the yeah. line, right? So the first message that we send is four days after that, after they've accepted the invite. Why four? So we want to give them time to actually see the invite, mm -hmm. accept it, and let it marinate a little bit because sure. our ads are still running, for one. Mm -hmm. Uh, and two, most professionals, it takes a little bit of time for them yeah. to see you in their feed. It's true. We're pre and we we preach being active on mm -hmm. LinkedIn. So if LinkedIn's algorithm, if you accept someone's invite, they immediately start seeing your content mm -hmm. because LinkedIn wants to show the new content for the people that you just accepted to see if you're going to engage with it. Yeah. So we try to give a few days for them to see content in their feed too. So now we've got ads. Couple more touch content. Points. Yeah, so it's like, wow. so we need a couple of days for them to to continue that subconscious, like, and you said it best, and this is exactly what we tell clients, like, we want you to appear that you're everywhere, mm -hmm. but you're not. Yeah. Okay? And you're going to, people are going to think you're spending millions on advertising, mm -hmm. and you're not. <laughs> hey, it's just a massive company yeah. that has this huge track record. Right. And it's, no, we're just very targeted mm -hmm. um, to who we, who we want to reach. So wow. now to them, they're going to think you're everywhere. But again, you're not. So that's the reason we wait four days is we want them to, one, we want them to understand we're still human. Because mm -hmm. if you accept an invite and immediately you get a message, that's I, I just know immediately. I'm like, why even bother? This yeah. is a lot, right? It's very clearly <laughs> some automated workflow. Yeah. So delays are very important mm -hmm. for multiple reasons, but mainly, you know, to continue those touch points and make sure they understand you're human. And four days has been that kind of sweet spot. It's for a sweet you. spot. Three, and three or time. four. Yeah. Three or four, I would say. Gives them the time to see the content and also spaces it out enough to where it's, it seems like it's someone reaching out for the second. Day. Yeah. Yeah. So three or four is a good a good delay that we found. Uh, any longer than that, and it's kind of like they forget you even sent the invite, you mm -hmm. know, and it's like, so it's just a good kind of the sweet spot. So that first message after that four days is basically just us following up you know, saying, hey, hope you're having a great week, you know, but basically a small introduction. You don't say what you do, nothing like that. This is so interesting because I get a ridiculous amount of just like workflow type things in my LinkedIn messages and I kind of have to just ignore them because I have to focus on what I've got to do. Yeah. And I'm thinking about getting the exact type of messaging that you're talking about and it would definitely work on me. Yeah. Like I, I like to think I'm pretty good at filtering out that kind of thing and like really focusing on only like the best stuff. And I really do feel like this stuff would work on me. And I yeah. have gotten great at ignoring stuff that feels automated and feels. Yeah. yeah. And it's funny because like <clears throat> it, it used to, we used to think, oh, this works way better on older people because they don't really understand. And I hate to, if we got older listeners out there, um, this is not to, <laughs> you know, it's to mostly little you at all, yeah. but, um, you know, 
they're not savvy to technology. Mm -hmm. And so they don't really understand like all of these tools that are out there now that, you know, for automation and, yeah. you know, all these APIs we can connect now to connect all these tools. And um, and I, I have a marketing background, so I'm savvy to it. Even people my age, a lot of times wouldn't understand like a lot of this stuff, like the automated workflows and how deep that goes. Yeah. So because of that, we used to get a much higher response rate, you know, mm -hmm. from older people. Yeah. Um, but we're seeing now with a, the more human approach, like mm -hmm. it's across the board. Like, yeah. you know, it doesn't matter. Like you could be 20 and, and straight out of, you know, or 22 and straight out of college. That's incredible. And they'll respond and be, and yeah. like it's an actual person. And, um, and so, and that's kind of how we gauge it is like response rates, right? Yeah. Like, okay. If, if we're not getting response rates, something went sour in the messaging or mm. we feel like a bot or the, or the timing was off or like, so we're constantly trying to optimize that flow. Yeah. Um, and it's a little bit different with each industry, but for the sure. most part, it's very, very similar. Yeah. So that's good. That makes it easy to replicate. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's a, about a five cent for the sake of time. I have, I'll, I'll make sure your listeners get this. I actually have this, like, um, I show the full flow, the messaging sequences, all that oh, is cool. totally free. Like a visual representation. Yeah. Yep. Awesome. And yeah. so, and I actually recorded a video where we actually walk through the whole thing. Yeah. I'll make a note right now, yeah. but I'll probably just overlay it over the yeah, video. Yeah, that's totally yeah. fine. Um, but yeah, I show the, I show the sequence, the flow, the delays, how much they, how long they need to wait, um, everything. And it's, and it's a PDF of the flow and a PDF of, or a Word doc of the messaging we use. Um, now, obviously, you're going to switch it up because I only show two different industries, but, you know, they'll get a good enough idea. They're more than welcome to have that. Uh, so you can, you know, share that on YouTube. We'll send you a link or whatever. Sure. But um, but for the sake of time, I won't go through the other five sequences. But the point is we're bringing value at every step of the way, mm -hmm. right? And even that second message is like, hey, you know, check and see how you're doing. Hope your week's going well. Mm -hmm. um, and then we'll say, you know, Happy to be a resource. Anytime you may need something, let me know. Just keeping them top of mind. Just keeping them top of mind. And like, I think it's the third or fourth message. We will come back and say, and this is intentional. Mm -hmm. um, we will say, again, you know, it's three or four days later. So we're like, we always lead with like, hope you're doing well. Or hope, you, hope your week's going great. I just realized I didn't tell you who I am or what I do. And so... And we even apologize. We're like, mm -hmm. I'm so sorry. I just realized I didn't tell you who, who I am or what I, what I do. Here's a brief description. And we keep it super short, like one or two sentences. Mm -hmm. Like, hey, we're, I'm a, I own a B2B growth, comp, you know, growth agency that helps businesses grow their bottom line, right? That goes back to that story work that you did in the first place. Right. Where you've been able to distill it down to like the yeah. most targeted, intentional. Yeah. Version. And we're pulling those top one or two triggers. And mm -hmm. that's what we're putting in that one or two sentences. And then after that, nothing. It's yeah. like, you know, actually at the, we say, we, I, we do say in one of those, and I, I depend, depends on the industry, uh, we should totally connect if you have some time, let me know, always here's a resource. So yeah. we do softly yeah, in that like third or fourth message offer a chat, right? Mm -hmm. But that's it. Yeah. <clears throat> and then we move on. And I think there's a, f there's a value add in the fifth message where we say, hey, th you know, thought this piece of content would be valuable for you. And it's a really good piece of content specifically for that industry that we pass. Um, and we always say, let me know if you'd like me to send it to you mm -hmm. um, to try to initiate a response. Nice. Uh, and so a lot of times we'll get a response there. Like, yeah, shoot it over to me. And we're like, great, shoot me your email and I'll, I'll forward it to you. Mm -hmm. um, and if they're like, well, can you just send it here? Not a problem. Like we got the link there. We'll send it to them. Right. Awesome. But we're constantly trying to make sure that we're getting little bits of information like, is the email accurate before we start this email sequence, yeah. right? So it's like we're just trying to verify stuff and move through the sequence, you know, trying to gather as much information as we can. And then we will have an appointment page ready. So if they're like, yeah, we totally should chat, that follow-up is actually a link to the appointment page so the business owner never even has to, like, you know, communicate. Yeah. They can schedule it on their own. There's no back and forth. It's going to pop up on their calendar. Yeah. It's, it can be on, it can, you can use Calendly. HubSpot's got a great tool. Chili yeah, Piper. A, a acuity so on uh, Squarespace acuity. is great. Yep. Yeah. So, so many, it, we are, com we are almost like, um, software agnostic. Like we don't care, mm -hmm. right? We don't care what you use. As long as it works. Yeah, yeah. As long as we've got a, 
a way to tie it into our CRM systems or whatever, mm-hmm. and it's got an API. Or, as long as the functionality is there. Yeah. yeah. Or it's, you know, on Zapier or, or Make or something mm-hmm. like that that we can pull, you know, information from a JSON or, yeah. or API or something. We're totally fine. So yeah. we're totally fine so with whatever Zapier is incredible. Use. You can yeah. do so many different types of APIs. Yeah, it's it's great. So you bring bring a little bit of value, and then you're off to the races. Okay, so we have a... We have two different sequences that trigger our, our email outbound. Uh, if they don't accept the invite, we wait two weeks. If the invite's not accepted, then that triggers the email sequence that goes out. And that first email, if they don't accept, just says, hey, you know, shot you an invite on LinkedIn, checked out your profile, you know, would really love to connect. You know, let me know if I can be a resource anytime. That's the email. So it's very similar to what happens in LinkedIn, but if we can't get to them in LinkedIn, some people aren't active, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so some people just never check their messages, never will. Right. Yeah. And so, <clears throat> so what we've done there is we've immediately shown that like we have already been trying to reach them, mm-hmm. right? And so it's it's not hitting them with a sales message. It's like, hey, trying to you know, since you invite on LinkedIn, checked out your profile. It's like this, like, oh, okay, let's. That's cool. Like yeah. they go over to LinkedIn. Sure enough, there's our there's our invite, right? There's our view because it automatically views their profile before it sends the invite, so that we can verify that we did view their profile. Yeah. So a little little tip for you guys out there: mm-hmm. if if somebody sends you an invite and you go check out who viewed your profile and they're not on it, they're using automation software. So. <laughs> huh. Okay. So we always we always do that. Yeah. Like just to in case somebody's savvy enough to be like, did they view my profile? Just to cover yeah. that base, yeah. And not all LinkedIn automation softwares do that as well. So yeah. you want to verify if you are using LinkedIn software that it does that. Mm-hmm. Connected's a great one. Wallaxy, um, there's there's a few good ones out there. I don't suggest don't suggest Alfred. Okay. Um, but yeah, there's there's a few out there that are that are that are really good. Um, so what we're doing if they don't do that. Initial, oops, excuse me. If they don't um, accept that initial invite, is verifying that we, hey, we did, we did send you an invite. We do know who you are, you know, and we can kind of start that same sequence in email. Mm-hmm. If they haven't responded after our multiple attempts in LinkedIn, we will then send the same, very similar, an initial message over email that is saying basically the same thing. Hey, sent you an invite. You know, so awesome you accepted it. Been keeping an eye on your profile, sent you a few messages on there, haven't heard back, you know, just wanted to kind of shoot an email over. I know not everybody checks their email or their LinkedIn all the time, so wanted to connect with you here as well. Very soft, Another right? good touch point. Yep. So, and then the follow-up there is very similar to what we would follow up with in LinkedIn. Bringing value, letting them know you're there as a resource, giving hints to what, you know, what you do. And it's, if a, a good a good rule of thumb is like, don't overthink your messaging, like, mm-hmm. It, yeah. people spend way too much time on messaging. Like you don't have to overthink it. Like just think in your head, if you want to start this and you want to do it yourself, cause you, you know, you don't can't pay an agency or, you know, you, you want to start small, maybe just do a small LinkedIn campaign. Mm-hmm. Just think when you're building your ICP yourself, even if it's in your head, like you got to think, um, when you're messaging stuff, I solve this problem. Yep. Do you have that problem? That's it. Yeah. That's all you got to think about. And so, if you're if you get down the sequence enough and you do want to say, hey, this is a little bit about us, you know, then you can just say that. Just be like, hey, you know, we help B two B agencies grow and drive qualified leads that mm-hmm. close. Yeah. You know, do you have a lead generation problem, or are you struggling to find leads? Yeah. It's that simple, right? Because somebody needs to know what you do, and they need to know. You got to know if they have that problem. If they don't have that problem, you're it's not a fit. I like the asking, "Do you have that problem too?" Because I get so many that say, "Hey, I noticed that you have this problem." And I'm like, first of all, where'd this come from? I never said I had this problem. Like, I don't know why right. you're assuming I have this problem. I'm going to tune you out immediately. So I like yeah. the asking because it's like, "Hey, do you have this problem? If not, no worries. We'll move on." Yeah, it's funny you say that because I I got a message in. Um, my inbox, mm-hmm. uh, I think it was l- last week or two weeks ago, maybe. And the guy who shall remain nameless, um, <laughs> it was, and I, and I don't, I don't say this to like, you know, dog on sales guys, like they're doing what they know to do. Mm-hmm. Right. And they're doing their best. So yeah, I totally get it. Kudos to him for actually sending emails. Like most mm-hmm. people, you know, don't have the, <laughs> the, uh, audacity to like really get in people's inbox. Mm-hmm. So but his opening email was basically, hey, 
um, you know, uh, I've done my research is, is exactly quote, like verbatim what he said, I've done my research and you're missing out by not using this, Mm. this product. And so me being the, you know, if you guys are into the Enneagram, I'm an, I'm an, you know, seven, eight, more probably an eight, which is like, you know, very strong personality. Yeah. Um, and so I'm like, all right, no. Like, yeah. We, so I just sent him a message back and said, hey, this to help with your deliverability so that, you know, I'm actually responding so mm-hmm. that, you know, the next person you have a better chance of getting to the proper person. <laughs> I said, I do want to let you know. Uh, I know you said you did your research, but. Here's who I am and what I do, and mm-hmm. here's the problems your software solves and the people you should be going after. And so I never heard back from him. I don't yeah. know, you know, where he's at or what he's doing, but hopefully it gave some value to him. Yeah. Um, he's probably know. over reassessing some things. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> but yeah, that that's what that's what stinks is like if you're going to make a bold statement like, hey, you know, um, I forget what he said. He said, uh, uh what did I say he said? I he said that he said he did his research. I did his, that, yeah, yeah, I did I did my research. This is exactly what he said. If you're going to make it that bold of a statement, then you better be able to back it up. With and, accuracy. Yeah, right. and I better be able to say, holy crap, this guy. Now, yeah. he was probably sending enough emails that maybe one game. or two people did say, yeah. oh, wow, this guy has done his research. And that's the risk you take, right, mm-hmm. um, with a lot of that. But sounds like if, it could be expensive, though. Yeah, it could, and it, and it kills your de- it kills your deliverability because when somebody sees that, they're not going to respond, mm-hmm. right? And so the less people respond in your email campaigns, the lower your deliverability is for your next set of you know emails to your next ICP. And so it's just a, it's a game you don't want to play. Yeah. So anyway, hopefully I was able to bring this value, but you don't want to get caught in that you know the structure of trying to say something like you said. You know, I, I forget what you said. They said to you is like. They basically, I, I get a lot that just say, hey, I notice you have a, a lot of times it's like a lead generation problem. And the problem I have is like, I, I just don't have enough time to do stuff. Like I, I don't yeah. have a lead generation problem. We have plenty of leads. We're just trying to figure out how to service them better. So it's, it's like, you know, being someone telling you a problem that you don't have, you're going to tune it out immediately Yeah, and just telling you, not asking you. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, so that that's kind of our, um, you know, after the email follow-up, obviously we're retargeting all of this. Everything's driving to an appointment page or a booking page or a demo page because we work with SaaS, uh, a few SaaS companies too. Um, you know, whatever that conversion goal is, it doesn't matter. That's the ultimate goal. So we'll, yeah. we'll build the landing page out that has our specific pain points, our specific problems we solve with that booking page. Yep. So that we can drive. A lot of times we'll do video on that page too That's from really the owner. Yeah. You know, That's that smart. talks about, hey, this is why we can serve restaurant owners so well, or this is why we can serve these people so well. And if you think about it, the owner of any company is going to be able to deliver that story message better than anyone ever could. Absolutely. It's, yeah. It's the literal top most, I forget what we were talking about before, but the, the raw, when we were talking about that book that you mentioned, yeah, it's again, talking about that, it's the most raw, unfiltered version of that message. Exactly. Yeah. Story. Yeah. Cause he, he's the one that is driving that. Mm-hmm. Right. So, um, and sometimes you can, I mean, if it's a big, if it's a big, you know, organization and, and we can't nail that, you know, president or CEO down, yeah, that's fine. We'll go to the marketing director or somebody, sure. you know, that can do it well, or we'll use talent to do it. Mm-hmm. But, um, but at the end of the day, yeah, it's definitely better when it's the, you know, uh, high level executive. Yeah. So yeah, so that's kind of the. Now we're reta- like I said, we're retargeting all all along the way, but that piece of the conversion codex is probably our secret sauce. Yeah. No, um, that's an incredible so, system that you have going on. That that's it's very complex, and I love how, I love how current it is in the sense that it's really you know, it's getting past that perception of the automated workflow that's very obvious what's coming at you. And it's kind of getting past that. And it's, it's just ahead of its time. It sounds like. That's yeah. But, and it's, it still excites us. I mean, mm-hmm. it's, it's fairly new. I mean, we just kind of renamed it, you know, yeah. the conversion code, we've been doing it for a long time, mm-hmm. but we just kind of renamed it conversion codex because there's, it, there really is a methodology to it. And we realized that after doing it, like, we're like, okay, yeah. wait a minute this doesn't change that much, Mm -hmm. you know, regardless of industry or who the ICP is, Mm -hmm. the messaging changes, but the actual process doesn't change that much. Yeah. Um, Conversions might change. Conversion goals might change. Messaging might change. You know, 
uh, things like that. But the the methodology doesn't change. The methodology of getting to the conversion. It's yeah. got a great ring to it too. The conversion codex. It yeah, sounds cool. Yeah, I like it too. It's 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 cool. So uh, if you go to the conversion codex dot com right now, there's nothing there. So don't. <laughs> <laughs> there will be soon, but yeah. uh, but right now there's nothing there. But yeah, so that's kind of the secret sauce of what we do. Um, it it's it, like I said, it still excites us. You know, it gets us. Uh, we love, I love personally guaranteeing like our work because yeah. agencies just don't do that. Exactly. And so like if we've just, de- if you've decided, Hey, look, we, you know, we really need 40, you know, demos booked each month to meet our revenue goals. Mm-hmm. Then we'll be like, okay. You can backtrack from that. And yeah. Figure out we can back into it and say, okay, like let's see based on our number of ICPs and our typical data we see if we can hit that number. Makes it a lot easier to sell too. It's like, I mean, it makes the decision easy. If you can guarantee results, why would you not try it? Right. And that's what we always say. We're like, look. And so we've, we've got kind of a structure. You know, we've, we've done a guarantee different ways, but we've got kind of a structure put together where it's like if we don't hit our numbers, mm-hmm. right, then you get kind of a credit next month for the numbers we don't hit. So, nice. Nice. Um, never had, we've never had to old. do that uh, to this point, so that's, fingers crossed. That's awesome, though. But uh, but yeah, it's it's uh, it's worked really well for us, and and I'm I'm pretty excited about it. So awesome. Well, th- thank you for sharing just the the whole way that works. I was fascinated. I mean, I'm a I'm a nerd about this stuff. I love yeah. getting deep into the details like that. So that was really cool. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's all about data, man. Well, on a, a little bit of a different note, I did also want to talk about this podcast that you're getting ready to launch pretty soon that we're probably going to hop into and yeah. kind of like switch gears a little bit here in a second. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, super excited about that. Um, it's got a really cool name, Conversion Codex Podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's uh, it's actually called the B2B Conversion Codex Podcast. Um, yeah, we've, we've, uh, we've got, uh, well, at launch, we'll have 10 episodes uh, ready to go. Uh, some really, um, really cool interviews, um, where we kind of talk through, you know, uh, individual business owners with individual business owners, business owners about, you know, some of their successes in marketing challenges they faced. And then it's kind of like an open brain brainstorm with them to kind of see, okay, you know, what do you think could move the needle now? And we actually kind of use some of our knowledge to kind of help. It's almost like a looking in on a brainstorm or, or agency strategy session, which is kind of cool. Mm-hmm. Um, because there's, I mean, already, I just, I feel like it's going to bring so much value to business owners to be able to, to sit in on those sessions and be like, oh, wow, like this is a great idea or, you know, we should try this or, uh, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. I'm really excited to check it out. And I think we're about to hop into an episode here in a second, yeah. but, um, You'll be launching in early October. I think it's actually going to line up perfectly with the release of your episode here. So check it out. It'll be in the uh, the description or the show notes if you're listening on audio. Um, the B2B Conversion Codex podcast. Or will that be on um, audio only or that? Or it'll be that audio, audio and video. video. Uh, so awesome. we'll have, uh, it'll be on Plenty Agency's uh, YouTube channel, which for now we'll probably end up doing a B2B Conversion Codex YouTube channel as well. But yeah, anywhere you listen to podcasts, it'll be there, but we'll have video on LinkedIn and YouTube as well. So Awesome. I'll definitely be checking it out, and it's it sounds very exciting. Launching with 10 episodes, can't recommend that enough. I launched with about half that, and I made it this far, but it was it was pretty <laughs> difficult. It was, the the uh, episodes catch up pretty quick. Yeah, They do, they, they yeah, do, yeah, before you know it. So you always want to be ahead. That's the way to do it. Yeah, for sure. Exciting. Well, Matt, I've got a couple of repeat questions that I usually ask, and we kind of talked about this off air, but the first one is, so we kind of talked about the way you got into this career and I'd say kind of the the starting point or a big starting point for you, or pivotal moment in your career was Slam Agency, kind of starting your first agency. So if you could go back in time and just talk to a young Matt, you know, as he was starting his first agency, getting into that and take some of the wisdom and knowledge that you have now that you've just gained over that journey, what are a couple of things you would tell him to do differently? Oh man. Um, <laughs> young Matt was, was, wasn't quite as, uh, wasn't quite as smart as, as, or I should say as wise as, uh, as older Matt, and I've still got plenty of uh, wisdom to gain, that's for sure. But I think when you're young, you, you know, you move really fast. Uh, mm-hmm. And and sometimes you forget, like, you know, relationships sometimes can be more important than, you know, making a buck or, you know, a, a quick dollar or <clears throat> anything like that. So I think if I, if I had to go back and, and give, 
one piece of advice, I would say just slow down, you know, slow down, enjoy it. Um, look around you, you know, look at the relationships around you, look at the team members, you know, um, opportunities, things like that. And just, just slow down. What's that Ferris Bueller's day off quote? Life moves fast. If you don't stop and look around every once in a while, you might miss it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It's, it's so true, man. I mean, I just, uh, I just think back at, you know, potential missed opportunities and relationships and things like that. Cause I was just moving so fast and, um, and when you're young, you can do that, you know, and, and I still move pretty fast, but it's in a, it's different now, mm-hmm. you know, it's, uh, um, it's gotta be sustainable, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's just so different now. And, um, so yeah, I think, I think that would be my piece of advice is like, do what you got to do to grow the business and, and have fun, but like slow down and enjoy it. You yeah. Know? Um, absolutely so yeah that, that's probably my I, I mean i would i would i we would have a long talk i have a lot of advice yeah. for my for my <laughs> younger self but i think that would probably be one of the main things i would probably need I would to spend a whole myself. week with them just <laughs> yeah. like going over everything <laughs> yeah and i'd probably bring a baseball bat with me and beat some sense into <laughs> yeah. me but, but uh yeah you live you learn and you know i mean we've all we've all had those times you know uh that you know, we, we wish we could take back or we wish we could do differently or opportunities we wish we would have, you know, acted on. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just, just slow, slow down. I love that. Thank you for that answer. Yeah. And then the other question I have, I had not mentioned this one to you yet, so you could take some time to think about it if you want to, but the show is called profession session. So I like to ask everyone, you know, in every interview, what does it mean to you personally to be a professional? Um, I think, I used to think professional because I, you know, I grew up wanting to be in sports and I was in music and everything was like art and, and creating for me, you know, mm-hmm. and that's probably why I ended up in design. But uh, I used to think of a professional as somebody that like made a living doing, you know, what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. Professional baseball player, professional football player, professional musician. Um, I don't think that way anymore. You know, it's like. I think being a professional is is much less about what you do and much more about how you do it. Um, so anybody can be a professional at anything um, because being being a professional comes down to like character and the way you hold yourself and integrity and all those things. Um, not necessarily what you do, right? So because I know a lot of people that call themselves professionals that are that are nowhere near professional. Yeah. <laughs> And so, yeah, I think to me, it's just about, you know, the way you conduct yeah, yourself. It, are you, are you the same way, you know, with your team members and your, your clients and in front of your board, you know, uh, as you are at home with your wife and kids or vice versa. And, and, you know, can they expect to get, is Matt, can they, are they going to get the same Matt everywhere? Right. Yeah. Um, and be confident in that. And I think like that's, that's probably some of the best professionals I know. Um, some of the best people I know, um, are, you never have to guess what you're going to get with them, Mm -hmm. right? You always know. It doesn't matter if they're in a meeting, in a board meeting, if they're on vacation, if they're sitting down at dinner with you, like, you know what you're getting because you know who they are and how they're going to respond and how they're going to act because their character integrity, you know, is consistent. And so I I think that's probably, that's how I would describe a professional. I love that answer, and I, I this is my favorite question to ask because it's always a very unique answer from everyone. It differs a lot across industries and just across different professionals. So thank yeah. you for that. Yeah, That's you awesome. bet, man. Well, Matt, anything else you would want to plug or talk about or share with the audience? Oh, man, no. I think uh, I think we just about covered it. Uh, it, might, it might take a couple episodes, it feels like. But uh, <laughs> no, I would say, uh, yeah, you can find us at, at Plenty Agency. Um, you know, you've plenty dot C O E N T E. Correct. Yeah. Uh, and that, all that is, is just the Latin for, for abundance. Abundance so, there mentality. You there you go. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's plenty dot C O, um, or plenty agency.com. You can go to either one, find us there. And then, uh, yeah, just search plenty on, uh, pretty much any social platform. We'll be there too. So awesome. And look out for his podcast that we mentioned, Matt, thank you again for being on. This has yeah, been awesome. You bet Brody. I, awesome. I enjoyed it, man. Me too. Well, this has been Profession Session. I've been your host, Brody Vinson. My guest has been Matt Craig of Plenty Agency and many other endeavors as well. Stay tuned for future episodes. Until next time, 
Thanks for tuning in. Thanks so much for tuning into Profession Session. I'm your host, Brody Vinson. Stay tuned for new episodes every week and short clips of deep dives into specific topics that I put out on different social media channels. We can be found on YouTube, Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, TikTok, all major podcast platforms. You can find my guest in the details of this video or podcast. And if you happen to know a young standout business owner, professional, or entrepreneur that you would think would be a good fit for Profession Session, should DM me or get in contact with me anywhere and just let me know and they could be the next to tell their story here until next time again this has been profession session stay focused stay hustling and stay networking